stay on time target. But um, thank you all for coming and attending uh, our artist talk with Clara Nolte. Um, we are very happy to have you all here and very happy to have her work as well in the gallery. <coughs> uh, I just wanted to get started with a couple of thank yous and acknowledgements. Uh, my name is Elaine Waterman and I'm the executive director at the Firehouse Art Center. We are a nonprofit art gallery and art center located in downtown Longmont on the corner of 4th and Kaufman. So in the spirit of healing, the Firehouse Art Center acknowledges and honors the Arapaho tribe, the original people of the land upon which the firehouse sits. We also wish to acknowledge all other indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado home. It is because of their sacrifice and hardships that we are able to be here sharing this art with you today and the firehouse believes that we can only grow when we have a better appreciation for the history, the legacy, and contributions that the tribes have made, not just to this region, but to the nation. As far as thank yous, we wanted to thank the SCFD, or the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, the Longmont Community Foundation, the Community Foundation of Boulder, Boulder County Arts Alliance, Colorado Humanities, the Longmont Rotary, City of Longmont, LDDA, and the Creative District of Longmont for all their support. Uh, so I am here with Clara Nulty, and um, we are, uh, this is the opening weekend for her show, Palmsest. And I just wanted to start with a bio, so about Clara. Uh, Clara Nulty is an artist and educator based in Colorado. She holds an MFA in painting from the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills and a BA in Studio Arts from Carleton College in Northfield. She has shown at galleries across the states including Colorado, New York, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Michigan. Recently, she has exhibited at the Ortega E. Gasset Projects in Brooklyn, New York, and the Frank Lloyd Wright House Design, oh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Designed Smith House in Bloomfield Hills. Um, so Clara, I'm so happy to have you here, and I guess we can just start talking about um, Palimpsest, which is the name of your exhibit that opened this Friday. Uh, what does the word Palimpsest mean as a definition, and then kind of what does it mean to you? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really happy to be here talking about my work. Um, so a palimpsest is a term for a manuscript or document that's been repurposed, but you can still see the original impressions of the document that existed before. Um, this was really common at a moment in time when the technology of paper was much, much, much older and things like tablets or, um, you know, like working on stone or etching or working with paper, like reusing those surfaces was really important because it was so expensive to be making those surfaces and working with them. Um, so you would, could see evidence of the prior life of that document. And I kind of realized at some point that I was starting to do that with my work and make palimpsests. Um, and I think it's come to mean to me a way of expressing multiple thoughts at the same time or expressing multiple memories or, you know, a grocery list combined with a memory or something sentimental combined with something perfunctory. And I think that's just a way for me to visually describe at least the way thoughts occur to me and the way it feels in my brain when I'm, you know, thinking about what to make for dinner and also reminiscing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really human experience. I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people do that, although I can really only speak for myself, but it's become a very physical way for me to describe my own like thought process and um, kind of awareness and perception as a person. Awesome. Um, as somebody who makes lots of lists and is always <laughs> trying to multitask, I can, I can definitely appreciate that. Um, so as far as putting together the work for this exhibit, um, did you, kind of go into it creating with a theme in mind, or was it these specific instances that you kind of were putting to paper and then, um, you know, trying to find that connection in between? I, I think that 
moving from one painting to another is often a reference to what I've just made in the studio. So there's generally a good connective thread, um, but I don't necessarily plan out in a very intentional way. I'm not like storyboarding or creating some kind of architecture from piece to piece, but because it's all based out of me and because each painting I make is kind of reacting to what I've already made or getting ideas from previous pieces, I think that these things are uh, inevitably connected to each other. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, we are actually sitting in front of the alcove at the Firehouse Art Center and Clara has grouped uh, certain elements kind of in a, um, I guess in a, in a house setting because there is a table and there's a chair which Clara's actually <laughs> sitting in. Um, so in putting these items specifically together, is there a story or a reason? Um, what, what do these pieces kind of mean to you? Well, installation is really important to my practice. Um, when I'm working in my home studio right now, I don't always get the opportunity to have as much play with that because I just have more limited wall space. So I really wanted to take advantage of the opportunity being at Firehouse to experiment a little bit with the ways I could orient paintings on the wall and then the wall itself almost becomes another piece. So these are all individual pieces but they can also be a collective here. And I was, I've was i shown this table before and it had one painting sitting above it and based out of that I thought it would be interesting to play with the idea of a gallery wall so that premise of a very typical domestic setup of family photos and then taking my smaller works and replacing the people in those photos with whatever those smaller works are. Um, these tend to be sort of very mundane objects and I'm not sure if it's morbid or cynical or just a little bit odd <laughs> um, to, to replace what might be loved ones with these little objects, but I also think that all of these scenes are moments that have some kind of personal connection to me. So it's not like they're completely random objects either. They're, um, I mean, in some cases, like parts of my body, like there's one piece up there that has a bit of my hair on it. Um, I saw that during a solution. I was like, oh no, what's the hair? I was like, oh my God, it's like, oh, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, but um, no, it's glued there. So it would have been hard to take off. Um, so you said that you have replaced the people that would be in these portraits in a domestic setting. Do they relate to specific people? And if so, if, if, would you mind sharing if they do? Yeah, I, I think primarily they relate to me because these are all kind of objects and moments within my own personal experience, but I'm also not operating in isolation as a person. I'm in a community, in a collective, and I think a lot of the objects I'm using to relate pretty directly to the objects that someone else might use. So like a brush um, is my brush and it's important to me that I'm did, like drawing something that is mine, but it's also relatable because other people might have the same one. Um, there are some up there that get more personal as well. Um, the, the piece up here is probably good to Use it as, a, as an example, this piece um, I did right after the Marshall Fire. So I live in Louisville and just around New Year's, we experienced the Marshall Fire and I had to evacuate my studio and my home. And it was, you know, like the sky was raining ash and it was blackout and it really looked and felt like the apocalypse. And uh, I also was evacuating my studio at the same time. And obviously I, work on paper and so I was like well if it reaches here it's really good kindling that's terrible um but I did a couple of paintings it's this one and actually the one on the end there as well with the server are the things that immediately came to me to grab out of the fire like if I'm you know I had 30 minutes to put things in a bag we made sure we got the cat and that took a bit of time so you know with the remaining 10 minutes I had um, just wanted to make sure that I took the things that were the most like sacred to me and in the, that moment those decisions are really instinctual and also a little bit random like if you're yeah. starting yeah. to delineate between what objects matter the most to you how do you make that 
distinguish, <laughs> like how do you distinguish between all of the things you own? Um, and I guess that brings me to another point about like what these objects are and the idea of replacing people with these objects. Um, it is stuff and there's something sort of commercial about our experience in America and the way we are attached to our things. But I think there's also an emotional level to that where some of these things might be heritage pieces that have traveled from family member to family member. And it's not only stuff either. It's also like relics and pieces of history and things that connect you to other people or connect your own life experiences to each other. Um, so it's a little morbid and also sort of acknowledging the moments or like things in my life that feel tactilely important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that um, kind of what that weight of history, mm -hmm. um, is that something that you play with considering, um, you know, the documentation behind and the layers and stuff in a palimpsest? Is that how you bring that kind of like to the forefront? Because a lot of these uh, works, they do have writing in the background, mm -hmm. um, and some of it's obscured, and some of it is 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 very obvious. So, what is the meaning for that? Yeah, I think that idea of documentation is definitely really important. I think this might be an odd term to use for it, but my my works conceptually are intentionally soupy. Like there might be a you know in this mirror piece right here. Um, a you know envelope from the DMV that doesn't really mean anything or matter ultimately, but it came with a piece of mail that I got that felt stressful because it was from the DMV and I had to renew my license. And and so I think I'm I'm really interested, like you said, um, in history and traces of things throughout my life and how these sort of like fluffy meaningless documents might trace my experience through moving or through a big life change. And at the end of the day, the envelope isn't that important, but there is something emotionally weighted behind the envelope too. Um, and then starting to combine that too with things that feel even more significant. And so again, like it all sort of forms a emotional experiential soup. Yeah. Um. And the piece that you're referring to and the use of the word soupy, that kind of means like there's, like it's not a very clear image, but there is a lot of your work that is also super like realistic and very clear. Um, and, and is that a, a choice? Like which parts are going to be the ones that kind of float in and out and which um, images that you work on are going to be um, you know, kind of realistic and hyper-realistic? I mean, on a very basic level, I love painting, mm -hmm. and I and I love representational painting, and I love that process. And I have, for many many years, been based in an observational practice of painting, and that's a lot of what my schooling is in. So there's just kind of a fundamental enjoyment of that. Always needs to be part of the piece for me because I just really love doing that. But I also think it ties pretty significantly into the feeling that. Um, there's always a focal point and these painted subjects are also really tied to something in reality. So I think the documents are real objects but are also a little bit more theoretical and significant in terms of the idea of documentation or the idea of anxiety, um, whereas the painted subjects are very concrete. And I think also tackling that in a very full force representational way makes them even more concrete in comparison to these kind of ephemeral documents that I'm putting in my ground. Cool. Um, and your primary medium is watercolor, right? Yes. Um, I have definitely been experimenting a lot. So it it's my primary painting medium, but I think right now I'm working with so many different kinds of materials and really enjoying the play of that. So I also work a lot with drawing materials, pen, graphite. Um, a lot of these pieces, especially as the grounds get a little bit more layered, gouache has been coming into my practice even more because it's an opaque paint, or at least it can behave more opaquely than the watercolor can. Um, but yeah, watercolor is kind of like my day one soulmate of paint. <laughs> yeah. Cool. 
Um, and walking around the space and, uh, you know, at the end of the talk, we'll have a time to kind of like look through all the works and give you a chance to kind of ask questions as well. Uh, when we first saw your work, we thought it was on Canvas, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's not. So what is it on and, and how is, is that process? How do you do that? So nothing in here is Canvas, and I totally see how that's materially confusing. And I've been told a lot, that, especially when I've done like virtual studio visits, so all I'm sending is photographs. It's important for me that these pieces be recognized as dimensional, even when they're paintings, that they're over structure bars, that they have a dimensional quality to them, um, because I think that's important to my relationship to the history of painting. But it definitely makes them read like something that they're not. And I think that element has started to snowball a little bit more. And that's also part of where my grounds have started to build up and become even richer. Um, I've started to work on wood panels too. And I'm realizing that if I'm not taking full advantage of the paper as a texture, I should probably just gesso it and then cover it you know, with the papers and the like gel media and the crackling paste and all that, and then cover it again with the absorbent ground, which I use to make it um, like susceptible, I guess, to the watercolor. Um, because, you know, it's interesting for me to think about when the watercolor paper is important versus the documents are important and kind of, I'm, I'm really excited by that material conversation. Um, and I also just sort of really love that people don't totally know what the material is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you can create an alluring mystery about work that keeps people engaged in your conversation for longer, if it's, you know, a uh, unsolvable mystery that's annoying and then you're more likely to push a viewer away. But if it's something where someone is trying to figure out what your work is, then it's really fun because basically your paintings are talking to someone for a longer time. Cool. And um, you mentioned something about uh, how your work reads as something that they're not. Uh, so in this piece right here, yeah. it's a table and it's obviously a flat surface, but mm -hmm. you are doing it as if um, you know it's a three-dimensional object. And there are other pieces around as well where um, you know, these flat surfaces imitate life. And is there, is this something that, you know, is new or is this a progression of that? Um, how does that fit into your work? Um, it started from the vantage point of thinking about uh, like perception and the angles at which we view objects. So actually there's, um, I, I very often have like a very frontal view to things. Um, and sometimes that makes a lot of sense, kind of like this door painting, like you're often engaging with that subject face on and it's upright in front of you. And so that makes some amount of logical sense as opposed to something like this little fan painting where very rarely am I directly <laughs> looking at the ceiling from that angle. Um, so I really, is that the firehouse? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's our ceiling. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> the one and only. Um, <laughs> I love that it like makes a little bit more sense once it's in this yes. space too. Because uh, I was like, that could be the firehouse. Wait a minute. Oh, <laughs> <it is. laughs> yeah. Um, and I really love the idea too, not only that I'm referencing a very specific angle with which I would be looking at that specific subject, but I'm also tipping it to the wall. So mm -hmm. no longer are you craning your neck, you're observing it face on, but it's referencing an angle in your body. And I think that that kind of, um, enforced gesture from a painting is really interesting. And so that was a natural progression to me, uh, thinking about moments like that with perception, transferring to a table and having things be very frontal and treating the tabletop as if it is a painting because when you have a flat rectangular surface, everything is a painting. <laughs> um, but then it's also venturing into this area and arena of sculpture, which I think is, it's been, engaging for me to be in that dialogue. Cool. So looking around the space, is there um, a specific piece that you kind of wanted to call out or talk about the process? I mean, there's so many different like techniques used um, just in this space. Uh, is there anything that you kind of wanted to call out? 
I mean, so like back to the idea of palimpsest, I think whether or not you can see a lot of materials on each piece, the palimpsest model is like how many layers of storytelling I'm putting into something that ultimately might read as very simple, um, one subject and sort of a cohesive ground, even if there are a lot of layers or elements to it, or maybe just one subject and a lot of negative space. Um, but I do a lot of like narrative building into every painting. So it's, it's hard to pick one to talk about because they all have kind of big stories behind them. Mm -hmm. um, well, so yeah, you were talking about simplicity and also negative space. There is a piece to the far right, mm -hmm. uh, the one that has the actual like, because those are puncture marks in yeah. the paper, right? Yeah. Would you like to short? Sure. That's yeah. a good one. Um, I actually, I didn't, I hadn't originally planned to have that piece in the space, but it sort of came back to me after all of this, I don't know, trauma around the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, I do appreciate that taking so much out of context in my paintings and having sort of an isolated subject allows them to transform their own narrative over time and I've been having fun thinking about that but that piece definitely felt like it demanded to be in the space yeah. <laughs> since the beginning of July. Um, and that then, piece is yeah. False Alarm, right? That's yes. The title. So the title is False Alarm and I think that that resonates in a couple different ways. I came to that subject out of my own anxiety about Sunday having a family and what it means to contend with your own body and want it to do something and what if it doesn't. So like, what if I'm infertile? Which, you know, I am probably not. Like, I think I have the genetics to be okay on that, but I have a lot of anxiety. And so late at night, my brain whispers mean things to me sometimes. And that's just kind of the reality. Um, so, so it came out of, this grappling with what that means to me and my body. And I was making this piece and, you know, starting to have studio visits and it was in progress and people would come into my studio and have a lot of different reads on it, just based on what their experience was with contending of that aspect with their own body or someone that they know and love. So to some people that looks like complete relief, like, oh, thank God I got married and I'm not pregnant. Um, and I really love that it can have such strong reactions without being completely polarizing. It's not like we're on opposing teams, it's just that we have our own experience with that subject. So there's a lot about that piece that's very intentionally installed too. Um, I wanted to have the painting hung lower than a typical gallery standard height so that the pad is as close to the floor as I can get it because that's usually where I'm looking at that particular object. Um, I wanted to reference the pattern that was on that panty liner, so I ended up punching a lot of holes into the paper. Um, I think <laughs> a lot of what goes into these paintings is I'm often very low-key sad. Like there's an element of like small sadness in a lot of what I do, and so there was something really, really deeply satisfying about puncturing all of these little holes because I think that especially when it comes to women's rights, sadness is like right next door to anger. <laughs> and the process of punching just a million tiny holes into that very satisfyingly stretched <laughs> paper and hearing the sound of what that, you know, uh, I think I used a nail, what that nail mm -hmm. sounded like in the paper. It, it was really cathartic. Um, and when I put it up on the wall and it was hung low, it just felt like it could continue to expand beyond its rectangle and so that's why there are a few like tiny punched holes right next to the sides of the painting as well um so again it's just like palimpsest there are a lot of very lot small of moves that i'm yeah. making that feel really meaningful to me um, um and that destructive element like that rage close to the sadness <laughs> is that kind of the similar feeling that you had. I, I see that some of these paintings do have the, the fire and the burning, mm -hmm. and I know you said it was related to the Marshall fires, but was it the same kind of thing where you were like burning the paper and that was like, you, know, you, you had the control over your art in that way? Yeah, and that was, I, I had this idea about burning paper before the Marshall fire ever happened because I'm usually keeping a running list of what does paper do? Um, because I'm, 
I'm a painter who's interested in sculptural qualities, and there are a lot of sculptural qualities that paper can take on. So crumple, crinkle, rip, tear, bunch, burn, puncture, cut, all of those things are things that I keep as a running backlog of tools that I might use at some point. So fire had been on the list for a while, and then we evacuated for a fire, and I was like, well, I guess it's time. And um, I have an at-home studio in the place where the fire had just been, so my husband's one request was like, please don't now burn down our house. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> but I like very, as, as cautiously as possible, um, set up to be able to burn my work. And what I quickly realized too is while I thought I had control over that process, I really didn't. And so I do love those moments too where you are um, faced with something that the material does that you didn't ask for. But if you can embrace that in the painting, I think something really beautiful comes up. And I think that's also my training in watercolor that that is inherently yes. the property of watercolor. It will not do what you ask it to do. You form a partnership and you figure out how to work alongside it and guide it to where you thought it might go. And it always, if you can look at those uh, untamable qualities is a blessing. Watercolor will always like bless you with something that you didn't ask for and actually is really wonderful in the painting. And then you get to look like you have all this great control over material when really it's just like, you know, the, the watercolor deities giving you a gift. Um, <laughs> yep. Very cool. Um, as far as the challenges or um, kind of the really cool parts of installing in the space, um, you know, what was like your, your biggest surprise or anything that you wanted to kind of say about you know, how you were doing the work and anything like that? Um, I had a plan for this for a while. And so I was, it was really exciting to see the alcove come together, especially because I'm referencing this domestic space, but the alcove already does a lot of that for me because it's such a like funky architectural moment within this gallery. Um, Right before the week that I installed, I had this kind of like fever dream idea of making this wall into a canvas to put one of my like canvases on. Um, and I think all of a sudden this piece that it, the documents underneath it read really subtly when it's just, you know, sitting next to the wall in my studio at home, I think all of a sudden they become a lot more vibrant now that it's on a surface that's so closely mirrors what I did for the process for that painting. So that was really fun to see come together. Um, and also a little bit of spontaneity. And it's fun when you don't always plan for something, but something good happens anyway. Um, in terms of challenges, you remember, like putting this yes. painting up on the wall was is the hardest painting to install. And I was not expecting that. And I feel like it just gave me a lot more respect for paper because it was really heavy. <laughs> and it does, and you know, it's not heavy like I can't pick it up. It's heavy like the magnets couldn't keep it on the wall. And so there was a lot of like, oh, it's falling. Okay, catch it gently. <laughs> um, and I think it took 45 minutes. Yeah. Something like that, 45 minutes, an hour to try and like track down the right nails and make sure that we came up with the right process for getting it on the wall, it was um, kind of a pain in the butt, but also, again, gave me a whole new respect for what paper is, and maybe thinking about paper as a heavy material will inform something next, I don't know, but I've definitely been thinking about it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, when we uh, looked at your work for the open call, um, this piece that was uh, right here with the pod, um, really kind of stood out for us. What is the title of that piece and kind of what, talk to us about the negative space and, and maybe the meaning behind that. What does that piece mean to you? It's, it's called Pod. Okay. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm a little literal. Uh, I think they're, they're maybe like straightforward or plain speaking as much as I think that I tie myself in language not sometimes. I, I like to be a little bit blunt with my painting. Um, that piece came out of uh, actually a really hard critique in grad school and I think launched a lot of good things. So sometimes crit is very difficult and then, you know, if you can come out the other side, you'll have something good. Um, 
I was asked in a critique when I was working with all of this negative space and it was really, really empty. I want to know what your psychology is in this painting. And I was like, we're sitting in critique and you're telling me how bad my work is. I don't want to tell you what my psychology is right now. Thank you. Um, but then, you know, I was, I was thinking about that idea of like, how do I intentionally tell someone that I don't want to invite them into my story? And got this really, really big piece and basically stream of conscious like diary wrote, which isn't something I usually do. I don't really journal that way, but it was very cathartic. So I had it in kind of a landscape format and wrote everything I could think of. I think there are some really uh, hard moments of writing in there. I think I also have a grocery list in there because um, I was just trying to fill up a rather large service. And then I erased everything. So I don't actually have documentation of what I wrote on there. I think I might remember some of it, but I tried really hard to erase it as thoroughly as I could because again, the point was, I have told you everything and I don't actually want you to know what it is. Um, so to, I think I wanted to obscure the writing a little bit more, but I also wanted to give it this sort of like aged effect, which is where some of the washes of paint came in for me. The idea of like what you might do if you dip a document in tea to make it look like an aged piece of parchment. Um, and then at the end, painted a pot on there in part because I think that they're really interesting objects and fun to look at and they've got bright poppy colors, but they're also really worn and like ragged because <laughs> they are always being shipped across the country. Um, I liked how ubiquitous that was too. Like everybody kind of knows what that object does. Um, and and to me, it also kind of encapsulated this idea that I was, I was putting all of my thoughts and feelings into a box. And when you're using a pod, you, you put your whole life into a box. Yeah. And the way in which we box things up as a, a method of kind of containing your thoughts and isolating them and compartmentalizing and um, it just, I think sometimes I pick subjects and they feel a little random and then there's a link that I didn't know I was um, using to, to make some kind of logic for the painting. Um, but I have this balance of working sort of instinctively and then also a little bit more planned and try to let those two components of my practice work together instead of fight too much. <laughs> Um, so your work deals with memories, um, and you were saying mostly your own memories. Do you see your work as looking back to a particular time and place or kind of devoid of a time and place? You're removing it and, and making it for everyone instead of just, just for you. Um, I think that quality of when you're dreaming and you have all of a sudden an adventure in a part of the world that you're very familiar with, you know, like your childhood hometown or a place where your family went on vacation a lot when you were growing up. You have this very specific location, but then all of a sudden there's this random person who you haven't thought about in 20 years from your third grade class on the adventure with you. I think that's how I'm painting. There tends to be a lot of negative space, so it feels really out of context, but I think to me that's just the quality of, um, like paring down the story enough to the most essential parts of what I'm trying to communicate. Um, and I do really value that negative space decontextualizes something. And I think that makes it a little bit more mysterious or maybe more relatable. And I think there's also something about that much space that makes people uncomfortable. Like you want to fill it. And I think it's important to me to have an adamant amount of space to say, you can't fill this. Like you have to contend with what's right here and this is all you have. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna ask a question which is totally like from our conversation. So yeah. I know that you like Harry Potter because yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about it, we talked about a podcast mm -hmm. um, where these, these two professors kind of break down um, the story of Harry Potter. But looking at your stuff and the way that you talk about memory, it's kind of like it's the it's like kind of like the pen seat, right? Yeah, yeah. So you see these true. memories, but then you you try and fill them in, but they're kind of fuzzy. But then some parts are really clear, and some parts are really strange. Um, so it, it's kind of 
an interesting revelation to have that, to see that connection and know that. Is that kind of how you see it? I really love that as a framework. I think that's uh, an excellent way to frame it too because working from observation, it's it's a painting practice that tells you what I'm painting is going to look like reality. And there's some kind of uh, believed authenticity about what the painting must be at the end, you know, thinking about something too, like scientific illustrations, where it's supposed to capture, it, in almost a sort of generalized way, the most important details about a species so that you can identify it. And that quality of identifying makes you feel like there is a lot of validity behind this painting. And then you get into the practice of painting and you actually realize you're making a ton of interpretive decisions because the paint is not a three-dimensional material. You're translating three-dimensional world into two dimensions. And there is inevitably some level of like make-believe that you have to put into the painting to create something that looks authentic. And I think that that discrepancy is really interesting. And I think that that's true of memory too. You have these memories and you have these stories and they might be your own, they might be your family's, but all of that history at some point is going through someone's filter. And so it feels authentic when you're hearing it as a story. And there might be a lot of details, just like Dumbledore's memories are so much sharper than everyone else's, but it's still through his own bias and his own filter. And so there's some level of interpretation to be had there. And I think that's really interesting. I'm at that part of the process where they started yeah. talking about like how you can't trust Harry and right. everything like that. It's I'm glad you're listening to it. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I totally did. Um, well, cool. So uh, I know that you're also an art educator. Uh, has that changed your process as an artist? And if so, I continue to use the things that I learned at all levels of my own education constantly in my own studio practice. And so I think that there's something really natural about the conversation I'm having with students and what I'm doing in my studio. And I also just really love that when you're teaching, you're talking about creativity at a really basic level. And I feel like that always reinforces something important to me about the studio. Um, I, I really just don't think there's any conversation too basic to be had for an artist at any point of their career. So I really value that I get to continually have that conversation with a lot of different people, also because they always have their own observations about what making art is, and it's really wonderful to get that, you know, back and forth feedback loop. So, very cool. Yeah. And um, we're probably gonna break off and do question and answer, but the final question, and then if you wanted to talk a little bit more about your work, if we missed anything, is what is next on the horizon for you? Um, in the fall, I'm gonna be teaching a bunch of classes at Colorado State University, so I'm really excited for that. And I think, when you get to put your work up in a space and it's all together and it's vibrating in all new frequencies and all new ways, you start to notice things that you're not taking advantage of or it gives you new ideas. And so I feel like I have new painting ideas out of this experience. So after maybe a week or so of a break, um, I have new things that I'm really genuinely excited to play with. Um, example of that is, a, for this show, started to make these little drawings on the envelopes that come, the like return envelopes, and they're very like blank and clean um, and very like business like. And I kind of want to make my own envelope so that I have, I really love that you have that kind of see through part. And so it feels like something is obscured or there's a world happening yes, in the middle exactly. of the painting. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I might make a security envelope out of watercolor paper. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um, anything else that you wanted to share about the work or anything before you get a question and answer? Uh, I don't think so. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm very yeah. excited to answer those. I have a sort of a specific question. Yeah. I'm riding my bike around Marshall and Superior and I've seen a lot of really weird burned up fences. And is that an actual thing you saw or something that you imagined from other things you saw? That is an actual thing that I saw. So that was on Davis and Mesa. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, right? Yeah. I, I, it was really eerie because um, all of these fences had been gutted and 
kind of uh, like turned inside out by the fire, but they were still upright in their original position. So everything looked like it was floating. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I love playing with negative space. So I get, I get to reinforce that point if I want to. Yeah. Um, and I actually ended up looking up a topographical map of the Mesa, um, which is right about where the fire jumped across 36. And that was a very pivotal, scary moment for everybody. Um, so there's a erased pencil drawing of the topographical map, and then the burn lines, that one diagonal line that's running through that's a burn line is uh, the 36 highway. So different layers of narrative around what that fire experience was. Yeah. yeah. I was curious about, um, I guess when in your schooling you you know you were studying painting, you studied watercolor, or you preferred that. I'm guessing that you worked on paper for the most part. And when that transition from sort of your standard sheet of paper to then stretching it on stretcher bars, like at what point that? Because now you're kind of saying it's an important aspect of your work. Is it sort of has this kind of holds this larger space? And I guess I'm wondering what sort of prompted that transition? That's actually uh, a really good question because these works are kind of missing the intermediate <laughs> moment where I was figuring a lot of that out. So framing is really, really annoying and very expensive. And I was working on flat paper and then having to frame everything for a show and it wasn't <laughs> great. <laughs> so I, uh, Golden and a couple other companies make an absorbing ground that it basically acts like the base for a fresco. So the watercolor behaves differently on a surface treated with absorbent ground, but it does allow you to use watercolor on a lot of different surfaces that aren't just paper. Um, and that's how I'm doing things like working on the tables. I cover the tables in gesso and then the absorbent ground and then I get to paint on them. Before I started trying to figure out how to stretch the paper. I was using that absorbent ground on canvas, on wood panels, because I was really desperate to get into that wonderful world of not having to frame your work. <laughs> um, and eventually, it was during the pandemic summer, I had a lot of time on my hands. And I did a painting on paper and realized that I really missed the quality of watercolor on paper because it's, it's just very natural. It's that's the the you know peanut butter and jelly pairing. Um, so I was I had a studio in my sister's basement and had a lot of time to experiment and play. And I know that stretching paper is a traditional step in watercolor painting because it's a way to keep the paper flat, um, where you, you soak it and you tack it down. And I just thought that if you're soaking it and it's becoming pliable, you can just put it over stretcher bars. And I found some YouTube videos of people doing that and then just kind of did that process enough that the piece could stay that way because a lot of people who wrap over the stretcher bars tend to cut the painting off at the end anyway. So I just needed to have enough time to kind of finesse that process, but it's really fun. Like you just, you're soaking this paper. It feels like very loving and you have to be sort of gentle, but also the paper can take so much more than you think it can. Um, and I don't have to frame, yeah. <laughs> which is great. I'm so lucky. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. frames. None of these have a frame except this one. Mm -hmm. And I've been, because of where I'm sitting, I've just been staring yeah. at it for the last 45 minutes. And it just, it's overwhelming that none of the rest of them do. So why, why does this one have a frame? I was, trying to experiment again with different ways to use furniture because I've done this iteration of working with tables a couple of times and I wanted to start to find different ways to work with furniture in a kind of odd but domestic way. Um, and I found this clock at Goodwill and that's the door of the clock. So it is totally a frame. And I also was thinking about it as like installing a drawing behind a clock and what does that mean? And again, decontextualizing an object and recontextualizing it in my own fashion. Um, so yeah, maybe frames will come back into my practice. Uh, 
but probably in a sort of like installation way. I just really liked this idea that it was a door and it opened and shut and it had hinges and it framed information, you know, the time. Um, but then also, yeah, have this conversation potentially with traditional formats of how to display paintings. I think what's neat about that too, I noticed is that it's the one that we didn't paint it white. So it's, it's, sort of lacking in negative space a little bit. It's kind of pushing a lot of information right. and it's kind of hitting you with a very, very real and unaltered thing, which is really a cool contrast to the very real and semi-altered things, I guess. Yeah, I want to figure out if it always has to be white because I've been right. doing that for a little bit and I think it's always good to give yourself permission to do something that wasn't in your box. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have a good reason for why it's not white, oh, other yeah. than like, I was, <laughs> I don't know. You don't yeah. have a good reason in like another year. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love hearing that that's really notable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, when you sent like your progress photos and I saw the grandfather clock, it really tied in with the rest of your work because it seemed, it had that like dated memory kind of feeling because I don't really know anyone that's going out and buying new grandfather clocks like clocks anymore so <laughs> they kind of just connected to that like um, part of the past thing mm -hmm. and I, I kind of thought about like the way I arranged the paintings as being sort of this is like the domestic section of of the install and then there are some pieces on bigger broader scale walls that are kind of more isolated that are a little bit more exterior scenes and um, that's kind of as far as my logic went, but there felt like some something flowing about having a way to weave interior and exterior space together, but also kind of sequester them too. You have more like because you talk about like wanting to paint on different substrates, exploring new three sculptural type surfaces. Um, do you have like plans for more? objects and like what's what is the criteria of something that you want to paint on anywhere? I I think I need to give myself ample time to start to grab things and then alter them and allow them to fail. <laughs> um, I actually had a few pieces of furniture that I was hoping would come together for this show and they just didn't work. Um, I had like a weird cabinet that had a weird shelf that was like stuck in the middle and I couldn't remove it and then it made it really awkward to paint on. But again, I was really searching for something that wouldn't be a table and it, it just kind of fell apart. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really excited to continue to look for the next things. I really like the idea of doing the bookshelf and then I just need to give myself enough time to find a bookshelf because I really want to find something that has already been lived in or had a life again palimpsest um and then repurpose it instead of like finding an ikea thing and putting it together which maybe seems easier but um yeah i'm i'm definitely investigating it and thinking about it and spending time in thrift stores but nothing super certain has emerged yet <laughs> yeah maybe we can collab I know you like working on furniture too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen this, your work, hung on walls that weren't white? I had one show in like a coffee shop a long time ago, and the paintings featured much less negative space, although negative space forms were still really important to that body of work. And three of those paintings were on a blue wall, and it was <laughs> it was not something that I had asked for. I couldn't alter the space because it was a business in its own right. Um, and they just they really worked. So I'm, I'm open to that idea. I do think there's something lovely about the idea that I'm taking the white cube and intentionally making it mine. Um, that it's no longer just gallery walls. It's also part of my work in a kind of very connected way. Um, but I think it would be fun to experiment with different colors. I kind of think that this is sort of a venture into that where I'm altering the texture of the wall in a really big way. So maybe at some point. <laughs>
when I came in the other day and walked around, um, I kept looking at that little door behind you mm -hmm. and, and expecting to see something <laughs> in the bottom right corner because the work just kind of melts into the walls mm -hmm. um, so naturally because of that, that white ground. That's what yeah. kind of drove that question. And then I, again, because of where I'm sitting, I'm seeing that you're expanding the painting onto mm -hmm. the wall mm -hmm. in really subtle ways. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't see that on a blue wall though. That's true. I think it would probably change the content of the work, maybe, if I had enough time to plan ahead on it. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's not really an institutional critique in a strict art history sense, but I do like that I'm kind of absorbing the gallery into my work and not just hanging it in the space, which is a great tried and true method of installation too, but I, I like that play. Also, did you, because you said you were expecting something, there's cool. a tiny little painting down here for those who haven't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we were stalling the numbers, we were like, wait, hey, where's 10? And then you were like, it's down there. It's, just, it's like one of my favorite, it's, I think it's like my favorite piece just because it's so unexpected. And um, we got a picture of the kids. Like, yes. So, um, and just one, Actually, I have two questions, but I just yeah. wanted to say, so there was, as I was saying, like when I was cleaning the gallery, kind of getting prepared for the exhibit opening, you know, there was like, ah, there's some hair around this, and I was like, <laughs> and then Grace even mentioned there was like a pencil mark on the wall, and, she, and you know, it was like, is that something to be cleaned, or, you know, <laughs> and also there are these marks from like cups, where your initial response is like, oh, I have to wipe that down, but it's like, a, it's okay. Right. So it's, it's really cool how like these, Things that you think that you're supposed to erase are what you're calling attention to. So, yeah. and I think that to me is like the gesture of people. Like maybe they were just in the room with their coffee and they set it down and walked out for a minute. Um, these are all objects, but they're also connected, often to me, but I think to people in general. And so there's that sense of connection to somebody who's not there. And I think the guesswork of who that might have been is pretty fun too, at least for me. <laughs> Do you drink coffee? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so much coffee. <laughs> I, I've decided things have been like my life has been separating people into coffee drinkers and non-coffee drinkers. That's good. Um, it doesn't happen without the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question to you, and then um, if there are no other questions, does anyone else have any? No. Uh, I, I always like ending these talks uh, with um, you know putting something else out there in the world that we want to happen. So. If you would describe your dream project. I, uh, it's so hard. I think I, I usually need to like tie to something specific, but if I were to have just unlimited resources, I would love to make like a house. <laughs> um, sort of like Rachel White Reed experience, but actually like filling the house and making it more personal instead of impersonal the way a lot of her work does um yeah like if i were building a room and that room were intentionally formed around the paintings but the paintings were also formed around the architecture of the space i think that would be pretty exciting very cool that's awesome. So uh, I just wanted to thank you all for coming to our artist talk um, and also just a little bit of things that are happening at the firehouse. So we are having our summer on the street. So every Saturday uh, we have a festival that's happening on Kim Bark and Forth. So we hope you'll join us for that. Um, and I wanted to thank Clara for coming and talking with us and sharing her work and sharing her process and her thoughts. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you.